Golter, we know that in Montana there's a lot of hunters, a lot of gun enthusiasts, so you might as well shop local when you're looking for your next firearm or accessory, huh? So I Army, they got the best prices around and the best service you'll find anywhere. As the guys over there will tell you, shop with So I Army for a year, we guarantee you, you'll save some money. The other thing is they have great knowledge. There's a lot of questions that people have about the right styles and types to suit them and what it is that they're trying to do and all the guys over at Selway Armory know their firearms and ammunition and accessories inside and out. With locations in both Missoula and Bozeman, Selway Armory has some specialty products as well, including full Sig Sauer inventory for your best in handguns and much, much more. Like Coulter said, two brick-and-mortar locations, one in Missoula, one in Bozeman, and also online, tremendous inventory there. They'll ship everything you want, SelwayArmory.com. You change up the batting on your way. I'm not going first. <laughs> Rock, paper, scissors. You guys have all freaking practice to figure this out. Just like when I come over and say, hey, I'm going to lead off today. I'm guessing there was, there, was some fun, <laughs> there was some fun parts of practice today with the big band catching the punt and stuff, but then some pretty difficult conditioning at the end. What do you like just about the kind of dichotomy? Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, obviously, you know, can't be all work and no play, but the bottom line is this. You know, we have a we have a group of guys that were here all summer, and I took those guys. They had a little bit. We had the condition. We got to be able to run. We got to be in great shape, and uh, we wanted also to you know from a safety standpoint, you got to know what guys' conditioning levels are. It helps us determine the workload, and so I think it's pretty standard practice to have some kind of conditioning uh, test early in camp. You know, and there's guys that are all over the place. There's guys, guys that have been, you know, in great condition. There's guys that haven't been doing a whole lot. And so for us to be smart with them, we have to know what the workload levels that we need to give them are, and that's how we kind of determine that. The first down and back, Troy just dusted everybody, but then it seemed like people were trying to beat him. Oh, everybody's, yeah, they're saving their energy, you know. Like, <laughs> right. I can get him once, you can get him once. So, yeah, well, he knows one speed, so that's good. But do you like the fact that he pushed, I mean, Daniel Hardy and Ryan Lager are both kind of going after him. Do you like that competitive? Oh, absolutely. That's one of the things we're definitely looking for in that drill. And, you know, um, I go tell this story to him probably so many times they're sick of hearing it, but you know, we were at the Seahawks camp one time when I was at Washington and they had the veteran guys get up and kind of talk. It was a mini camp and they were talking about how to keep give these the rookies a piece of advice, how do you make the team? And one of the vets got up and he just said, Hey, I just wait for it to get hard. You know, I just kind of cruise when everything, when it's easy, I'm just cruising. When it gets hard, that's when I go. That's how I separate myself. And you saw some of that today with that competitiveness. Uh, Scrampos, you know, you talked about him yesterday a little bit, but you know, what what do you think he has to do to, you know, even improve from where he is right now? Obviously, yeah, I think the biggest practice. thing for for Jason is the opportunity that he's now going to have to take reps with the ones, and that's probably the thing that maybe held him back a little bit. You know, at the University of Washington, we got literally he was playing nose when he got there. Jan Danny Shelton, first round draft pick, was playing nose. Okay, oh. then. Elijah Qualls, fifth round draft pick was playing those. Then Vita Vea, first round draft pick was playing those. And then Greg Gaines, second round draft pick was playing those. So those are the guys that he was behind in his time at the University of Washington in that position. A pretty good group. And now with him having the ability to get more reps, more reps against good competition, I think that's really going to help to have him push his game forward. Has he fit in with the kind of team dynamic pretty, you know, pretty quickly? Absolutely. I mean, I think we knew that coming into this and the type of young man that he is and how he was raised, the culture that he came from, familiarity that he already has with guys like Bryce and Amandre. It was a very easy fit. His body, I mean, he looks different than a lot of 300 pound guys. Granted, he's 6'6, but I mean, what do you just think of the, the physical makeup he brings to the roster? I think Coach Saha does a pretty good job over there in the weight room. And so, uh, yeah, I think obviously, you know, having that mass is a part of being able to hold up on the interior of the defensive line. And uh, certainly, we're not going to try to get a 240 pound guy in there. So, you know, when James Williams was gone, we knew we had a hole there, and it just, you know, it worked out great. We got guys like Chase that's 285. We've got him, at, you know, pushing 300. And uh, and so we've got some options in there that that's definitely going to be good for us. D line is pretty sorry. Oh, D line is pretty interesting. Uh, you know, because you lose three big contributors, but you still have a lot of depth there. Yeah, I think that uh, I don't know that you can really equate how you're going to be able to replace the leadership that Tyrone and Zach and Tucker gave us. Um, but I really credit a lot of the, where the bar has been set to those three men. Uh, they just worked hard, took a lot of pride in that unit. And uh, you can see guys like Derek Marks and Bryce Sturk that are stepping into those leadership roles. And uh, we have a lot of talent there. And so they can't, they can't take downs off or somebody's going to go by them. And I think that that just really helps us to continue to develop depth. How do you evaluate the offensive line with a lot of guys coming back, but maybe some mixing mitt? In yeah, as well? this stuff is really hard to evaluate the offensive and defensive lines. And I mean, you know, probably in a perfect world, we would have let you guys talk to them after they actually had pads on. But um, I didn't think about that. That's my fault. <laughs> so, uh, you, you know, I mean, we have we have five, really six guys that have played a lot of football for us. 
And so, um, you know, Jake Sessions is kind of rolling in and out with the ones. You got Tui, you got Woody, you got Red. Uh, obviously Mitch Brott and Lewis Kidd and so those guys are kind of guys that are the glue of this and now really you know whether it's whether it's Dylan Porter or a transfer from Nevada or one of these young freshmen that step up that's going to be the kind of the most interesting part I don't know that there's going to be those top six there might be some mixing and matching but I think those top six barring injury are going to be pretty solidified and now it's who's that seven eight going to be. What stands out to you about uh, Jake Sessions just and how he's developed? You know he's just changed how he approaches everything you know a lot you guys come into college and they got distractions and you know some guys are you know, distracted by girls or distracted by partying or have a hard time with school, whatever it is. And now that he's a little bit more, more mature and has, has had a chance to grow into the program, you know, he's really developed into a pretty good leader for us and is a, is a guy that has a, a lot of positive energy. And, uh, you know, he's, he's put the weight on that we've asked him to. We've, he's smart. He can play multi, he can play both guard and tackle for us. And so that's a huge asset. How important is it for those core guys on the line to start setting the tone early in camp? Yeah, I think that's, again, it's difficult when we're out here running around and they're just kind of working their fits. But, you know, tomorrow when we put shoulder pads on and then moving down into to next week, it's, that's where it's all done. I mean, those guys have to have, have to set the tone for us up front for us to have the DNA that we want on offense. Since we're not in pads, you know, what are those little things that maybe they can do to help kind of set that? It's, well, I think the benefit of not having padded practices for the interior guys is you really are just focusing on your eyes, your hand placement, your footwork. And those are things that sometimes go out the window when you're trying to just knock a guy off the ball. And so really have a chance to work on the details of the fundamental of the position. Two, he's been playing a little bit of center too. What do you like yeah. about that? Or how do you think he's acclimated to it? I think he, you know, he's another guy that's a really smart. He's been around football his whole life. And uh, he's kind of got that happy-go-lucky persona, but he has a high football intellect. And you can never have enough guys at center. One of the things that I think Zach is very capable at center, but he's our smallest offensive lineman. And so that doesn't mean you can't do it. Sean Sampson had a heck of a career here doing it. And uh, the, the things that we've got to do is make sure that we can hold up with the interior. And just, hey, it's our best match. Hey, maybe Zach's really killing it at guard. Is that our best spot for him? And then that slides to me in. The objective is to get our five guys, our best five guys on the field. Is positional versatility an underrated part of the D-line? Get the ability to move guys around? Yeah, well, I think some of that comes to intelligence too. But I think, you know, if you have a guy that can just play nose, and that's all they can do, what happens when you get into a four down front? They got to come off the field. And so having a guy that can pass rush, has pass rush ability, can hold up against the run, has enough size to be able to hold up against the run, but enough athleticism that you don't have to take them off the field in third and extra long, uh, it's a huge asset because the more you're running those guys around, you know, you're also tipping your hand to the offense as to what we're trying to do in those situations. So I think that is definitely a big part of, of that in, that interior defensive line play. And so do you do you think your defensive line is, is versatile, the guys that you have there? Yeah, I mean, you look at Bryce, the guy that played Buck last year, we slide him to field end. I think Derek could probably play any position. Maybe no, I mean, he could play nose. It's probably not ideal at his body weight. He could play any position along the front. Amandre can play both to the field and to the boundary. Uh, Chase has had enough reps now. You can look at a guy like Marcus Faraday. He's another guy that can play pretty much any position along the front. So I, th I think we do possess that. We've talked a lot about the way fall camp has changed over the years. Is there anything you miss about how maybe it used to be? I just think these guys have got it so dadgum easy, it's ridiculous. I mean, it's, I mean, I understand the, the reason we're doing these things, and I think it's good for the game as a whole. I just feel like I was, you know, I was born too early and I had to, I was thinking about this, like we would do, I mean, even as a coach, we're doing doubles in Florida, okay? That was not a pleasant experience, you know? And uh, so, yeah, I think that I, I, I really, I, I applaud the people that are making the changes in the game, and I do think it's what's best for the student athlete. Uh, but, you know, I'm, I'm old now, and so I remember when, and, you know, the good news is, like I told those guys a couple years ago when we had our last double day, I said, there's going to be generation kids that will grow up and not even know what a two-a-day is. You know, is that good for society? I think that's something we should all ponder. And so I'll leave it at that. You guys have talked so much about the family atmosphere. How do you cultivate fierce competition within the scope of keeping the family? Oh, yeah. Like there's Hey, man, it, it boils over every <laughs> once in a while, right? I mean, we want to get that thing to 211 and not go to 212 on the water. So, um, And it's okay as long as, as long as they leave it on the field. I think that's part of a healthy competition. And, you know, those DBs are going to jaw at the wide receivers, and, you know, you're going to have that going on. And um, As long as they can drop their baggage here and make sure that it doesn't build, spill over into the locker room, and uh, they can understand that it's all in the spirit of trying to make each other better. With this being your fourth camp, do you think, I mean, does it seem a little bit more business-like maybe than it did early when you first got here? Yeah, I, I don't yell as much. I think that's probably good. Uh, so I think our kids understand the routine and what we're trying to get accomplished. And uh, I think they understand that we're going to be smart with them and try to you know build them for game day. And, um, not have a ton of contact, but get what we need to get to have our, our saw sharp and ready to go when we get down to Lubbock. And uh, yeah, it, it feels easier, I guess, because we're all on the same page.
with Tucker and Casey being in different classes, you've seen a, a year more of Tucker. So what does he need to do in the next 10 to 14 days to kind of take a step forward? What, what haven't you seen out of him that you'd like to Are you see? talking Tucker or Tucker Casey? Rolde. Yeah. So in Tucker's case, I mean, I think it's all going to come down to just consistency for him. Because, you know, as, as I was telling Matt, when he's in the flow, and you kind of saw that in the Wagner game, when he's in the flow, and even the second half of the South Dakota State game, he, he looks really good. He's confident. He's rolling. And he, there's days that he just... You know, it's like, what's going on? You know, ball's not coming off my hand right. And I don't know if it's a mental thing. I don't know if it's fatigue. Uh, but we need to see that consistency. Any update on Tyrell Thomas? So Tyrell actually, so here's the deal with Tyrell. He's got to complete a class. Mm. So yesterday was the last official day of class. But I'm kind of holding it over his head like, hey, man, I want to see the grade. And so uh, it's not an eligibility thing for him in that regard. But I just kind of want to make sure I, you know, he understands his priorities and that's going to be sitting out a couple of practices until we get those crates, which should be Monday, and he'll be ready to roll. Munchie was so good there last year, so obviously Tyrell will be a welcome addition back given the competition on the other side, right? Well, yeah, and that's why that's why I want to make him hurt a little bit. <laughs> I mean, those guys are up three practices on him before he gets a chance to get out here, so maybe he might you know, reevaluate some of his priorities in that regard. So, And, and I think he will. I think uh, you know, he actually did really well in his summer classes, and so I think it's going to be a, hey, man, you can't have enough good DBs. I mean, we, we it is so interesting to just see those guys back there right now because there's not a lot of windows to throw into. And it's a very good secondary. Coach, you mentioned re receivers. Uh, you've got a lot of depth there with the with the older guys, but there's some young guys out here turning some heads too. Yeah, I was really pleased to see. I thought the court, young quarterbacks giving those guys chances to make plays. You know, Blake Thielen put the ball up a couple times, and I think it was uh, Peanut made a couple plays, and and then uh, what was it? Our new guy Tyrone Marshall had a play that you know adjusted on the ball well, and uh, Ryan Lonergan. I mean, it was nice to see those guys going up and competing for the ball. It's kind of funny because the young guys don't, and it's like, yeah, yeah, I threw three picks today, no big deal, you know. The, those guys over there that are wrapped in a neck and neck competition, they don't want to make that mistake. But sometimes you just got to let it go. Go play the game. And, and I think you see that a little bit with the young guys. They're like, what the heck? I missed my read. So what? Let's go to the next one. And uh, they're taking shots down the field. And, you know, we got to do that a little bit more. I mean, like I told those guys, I'm like, hey, I'm putting my money on Kevin Cassis and Travis Johnson. Let them have a chance to make a play. Don't just check it down every time. You know, if we're even, we're leaving. Let's go make a play. One young guy watching the offensive line that stood out was TJ Sessions. Very athletic. Yeah, very athletic. What else do you think he brings to the table besides just his natural athleticism? I think that's probably his biggest attribute. I mean, you got a guy that's that big, you know, and it's 6'3 and three quarters and, and uh, probably pushing 6'4 and, um, you know, 285 and, and, and looks flat bellied and, and moves his feet really well. So, you know, he'll be able to, he doesn't have to be as a young guy, he's not going to have to rely on that mass because he can move his feet, he can get in position, and he can stay ball me man in terms of the leverage we want. So, uh, yeah, I like I like that kid. I do. I think he's got a he's got a bright future. It, very mature. First of all, he was here summer for a bridge program. Very mature. Very focused. Um, you know, typical Texas kid. Yes sir, no sir. Highly disciplined in his personal life. Very respectful. Um, and I think he's got some juice. That would be kind of how I describe him. Where would you say uh, Ruben stacks up with the quarterbacks, and maybe what is the next step for him? Well, I think you know right now his role for us right now with these is, is kind of getting these three these these two young guys kind of dialed. And uh, that's kind of what we've asked him to do. And uh, hey, once we get this thing squared away so we don't have to babysit them all the time when we go two fields, then we'll roll him into that a little bit. He's actually a very poised young man. I mean, you watch him operate, and he's, you know, even more so than Casey and Tucker sometimes, he's got a little bit better of a demeanor. And that's one of the things I really like about Ruben. Good? All right. All right. Well, Thanks, sauce. Guys.